These are your questions related to vehicle dynamics applied to race cars, and now it's time we tackle each of them. Hello everyone, this is Bruno. I'm a specialist in vehicle dynamics applied to race cars, and I'm here to answer your questions. So let's go to our first question. Why does towing on the rear increase stability? Differently than the front axle, on the rear it's even more straightforward why more towing will increase stability. When you put more towing on the rear, you're basically creating what we could call a slip angle preload. You're preloading the outside tire of a corner in the direction of the corner, meaning that when you start, when you enter the corner, you start transferring load and generating lateral force, this tire is already seeing a slip angle in the direction of the corner, which will help keep the rear stable, since the tire with the higher amount of vertical load is already generating lateral force to keep the rear stable. Even in a straight line, it's gonna give more stability in the braking zones. This happens because even though you cannot really always see it, but when you are braking, you have small movements of yaw and small amounts of load transfer. So all of this happens again, where you have a little more load on the tire that is holding the car in a straight line and keeping it more stable. Not only you increase stability, but you actually decrease car response. So you don't get as much car rotation because of the same reasons we discussed. Meaning that if you want to increase car rotation and stability is not an issue, one thing that you could consider doing is decreasing a little bit the rear toe in. Just be careful because this parameter is extremely sensitive. So every millimeter that you change will be influencing a lot the car behavior. What factors go into selecting a suitable road gradient range? in degrees per G. So basically the row gradient is how much row you get for each G of lateral acceleration. The first thing you should do to define what row gradient you are using is to do benchmarking. So typically a given car segment, being it a passenger car, a race car, a GT, a prototype or a formula car, they will have a specific range of row gradient that people typically use because they learn that for that type of car, it's what works best. But what considerations should you have if you have to come up with a road gradient range? Well, first of all, you need to understand how much support you need. If it's a formula car, you need a lot of support. You have to have very minor row or very minor uh, pitch variation. If it's a GT car, you can have a little bit more variation. You are not running as low and your aerodynamics is not as sensitive. Besides that, you need to think of low transfer. If your car is too soft, the row movement, the low transfer, for example, will be too slow and the driver will feel that. He will not have confidence enough in the car because he needs to apply the steering and wait for a few seconds or tenths of a second to feel the car um, find an, a new stable position. So in that case, it means that you need a stiffer platform that reduces the roll or pitch gradients. On the other hand, if you have a really stiff car, for some types of cars and drivers, it is not ideal because the load transfer too fast, the driver does not have the time to find the ideal steering angle that he needs at that um, corner entry, for example. So we also see that it's dependent not only on the car type that you're working with, but also the type of driver. Typically, a professional driver will be able to afford a lower row gradient, meaning a stiffer car, while we would see the opposite for an amateur driver. One last consideration is that you should have some, some level of adjustment range. So whenever you design a car, you should design your springs and anti-roll bar in a way that you can go from a stiffer platform, meaning a lower roll gradient, to a softer one, meaning a higher roll gradient. I've seen people saying that towing on the front axle improves the turning response, while other people say that tow out improves turning response. Which one is true? This is a very good question, and the answer is actually not that simple. There are many different reasons why towing or tow out on the front axle would improve car response. The first one is the slip angle on the front axle as you start to steer. In this case, more towing would help car response since you are preloading the slip angle in the direction of the corner once you start your corner. So let's say that you have towing. When you enter the corner and you transfer load to the outside tire, it's already pointing in the direction of the corner, helping the car to rotate more. So in this case, towing is beneficial. Next, we have the induced drag consideration. So if you run tow out, as you steer, the inside tire will have a higher steering angle 
it will generate more induced drag because of this slip angle, which will help rotate the car since it's a pro your moment factor. So from the induced drag perspective, toe out would give more car response, which is the opposite of what we just saw for the slip angle preload. Lastly, it all depends on the Ackermann geometry that this specific tire asks for. Some tires will need more slip angle on the outside tire and therefore towing would help. Other tires need less slip angle on the outside tire when it's loaded, requiring more tow out. Not only that, but naturally the car, as it corners, it will have different slip angles between the inside and the outside tires. So in this, from this specific perspective, do you need more or less slip angle on the inside and outside tires? It depends, sometimes tow in will help, sometimes tow out will help. As you can see, there are many different factors influencing the car response based on the alignment of the front axle. And sometimes they are contradicting. But this is why you see some engineers who find that with their car, more tow out will provide better response and a stronger front axle, while other engineers will see that tow in will provide this higher response. The best way to figure it out, test it with your car. Make a big enough change in order to be able to quantify that. So for example, for a professional race car, you could try to go from three millimeters or two millimeters of tow in all the way to two or three millimeters of tow out, back to back. Repeat this multiple times until you get a concrete answer if more tow in or more tow out is giving this higher response that you want to achieve. How do I determine the ideal spring stiffness for a Baja car? In the case of off-road cars, there are two main parameters that we will analyze when defining the spring and the stiffness package. The first one is ride quality. In this case, it's very important since the terrain is very rough. So we are trying to minimize load variation, minimize the impacts, and also work a little bit on driver comfort. This parameter is asking for soft springs. As you have soft springs, you are able to minimize the load variation on the tires. Now, the second parameter is that you need some sort of platform control. Not as much as with an aerodynamics car, but you still need to control the movements of the car, roll, pitch, but also jumps and landings. So you need to have some sort of platform control. So what you should do here is to first define row and pitch gradients that are acceptable. Also, extreme maneuvers such as landing to make sure that you're not bottoming out on your dampers too much. And you try to use higher values, for example, of row gradient and pitch gradient, so that you can run soft springs. In this way, you can find a balance between parameter number one, which is ride quality, and number two, which is platform control. The trick here, though, is once you have defined this spring that you're trying to run, you should also focus on the damping characteristics that you need for that. If you don't select the right damping, your suspension will not behave well. Even though you select a relatively soft spring, it will not minimize the load variation you can get out of the suspension. So by selecting the proper damping ratio for your system, you make sure that for that given defined spring stiffness, you are minimizing load variation while still having good platform control. Typically, a damping ratio of 0.7 could be a good starting point for your design. And from there, you can work with simulation or track testing in order to refine that. In summary, select row gradients, pitch gradients, and landing maneuvers that allows some body movement so that you can have soft springs but still resist the external forces and keep some sort of platform control. And after that, find the damping that matches this stiffness level you defined. How can I set my optimum damping ratios differently for bump and rebound? Well, first of all, let's think about the overall damping or the average damping between bump and rebound. This is a very good metric for us to follow since this will be one of the main factors dictating car behavior. Well, first, let's think about the overall damping ratio of the car, which would be the average between bump and rebound. This is one of the main factors affecting ride quality or ride behavior. Now, when we speak about the bias between bump and rebound, it will be heavily dependent on driver feedback, platform control, and dynamic ride height. So let's tackle each of them. So for example, if you want more support on the front when you are braking or on the rear, while you are on, under traction, you would want to run more bump, either on the front or rear axle. Now, if you want less movement on the rear when you are braking, or on the front when you are under traction, you would play with the rebound side of the damper adjustment. If you would like less aggressive impacts over curbs, for example, 
then again you would go back to the bump adjustment. So you are seeing a few examples where we would adjust only the bump or only the rebound. Once you make this adjustment, let's say that you decrease the bump in order to have a less aggressive impact over curbs. If you want to keep the same average damping ratio that we discussed, it's very important, you could actually increase the rebound. So by decreasing the bump and increasing the rebound, you create this bias, but the, at least the average damping, so the average potential of the car to dissipate energy over bumps is the same. Now, one thing that you have to keep in mind when you do asymmetrical adjustments of bump and rebound is that the car will have different dynamic ride heights. So let's consider the situation where you are running a bump biased damper setup, meaning that you have a lot more damping for the bump side than for the rebound side. In that case, when you are driving over a section of the track that is very bumpy, you, your car will sit higher, you have higher dynamic ride heights. That happens because since you have a lot of bump uh, bump damping, the car cannot compress on the damper, so it cannot go lower, but you don't have a lot of, damp of rebound damping, so the car can go up. So it keeps going higher and higher, and then you end up with higher dynamic ride heights. On the opposite adjustment, where you're running a rebound biased damping, your car will sit lower around the track. Again, when you are going over these oscillations, the damper can compress, meaning that the car can run lower, but it cannot extend as much. So as a consequence of that, your car will have a lower dynamic ride height. Sometimes this could be a good tool to use if you want to, for example, run lower in a specific part of the track, but also it can be harmful because since you are running higher or lower in specific parts of the track, you cannot keep as low um, ride heights as you would want. So it all depends on the goals that you have in order to define the damping bias between bump and rebound. What are the best setup changes we can make in a low speed cornering issue? Well, if it is a low speed corner, we know that aerodynamics will not have a big influence. So let's discard those changes. We'll focus on the mechanical grip. So grip coming directly from the tires or from low transfer. The first change that we should consider when we have issues in low speed cornering is the lateral load transfer distribution. So whatever axle we transfer more load will decrease the grip on that axle while improving the other one. So let's say that we have understeer. We need to decrease the load transfer on the front axle. For that, we should soften that axle. We could use softer entry bars or softer springs. But the opposite is also true. We could stiffen the rear axle by using stiffer entry bars or stiffer, or stiffer springs. The result is very similar, at least in terms of low transfer. Even if you have a, an issue with the front axle, if you change the stiffness of the rear axle, you will help the front, for example. Besides that, we could think of setups directly off the tire. So for example, we could change the camber. Typically, more camber will give you more, more force or more grip, but it's not always true. And also, we have to be careful with temperature distribution, with tire failures, um, with rules limited, regulation limitations, and so on. The second parameter we should think directly from the tire perspective is the pressure. Again, by changing the pressure, if you are at the ideal pressure, it will change. Or even if you put the wrong pressure or outside the ideal window, you will influence the low speed corner balance. Now, thinking of other setup changes you could make, since it's a low speed corner, we could use, for example, a caster adjustment. If you increase the caster, you will gain more camber from steering that helps you recover the camber you lost on the outside tire. So that could be very effective for low speed corners while not affecting high speed corners. You could also think about changing the differential preload. In low speed corners, you have a lot of wheel speed difference meaning that the differential setup will also be very influential. Typically, if you increase the preload, you will get more understeer, and we have a complete video on differential preload in our performance engineering series. You can find the link to that video in the video description. Lastly, something that we have to keep in mind that is heavily influential on the car balance, not only low speed, but particularly on low speed, is driver input. So if you are braking, if you are on the throttle, depending how you apply the brakes, how you apply the throttle, you will, you will influence car behavior. Since in low speed corners, you have a lot of deceleration with the braking and then traction out of the corner that could amplify even more the influence of driving style on car balance. So don't think only about car setup, try to understand if it could also be coming from your driver. We have two videos analyzing driver inputs and how these inputs influence car balance. You can also find the link to those videos in the video description. So these were the answers to your vehicle dynamics questions applied to race cars. 
If you'd like to submit more questions like these, you can send them to our Instagram profile. If you're interested in this type of content, you would like our seminars. We have a seminar fully dedicated to applied vehicle dynamics, where we're discussing these questions and a whole lot more throughout many days. And we have also our performance engineering seminar, where we tackle how to optimize the car performance based on data. Besides that, Optimum G offers the following services. Performance engineering, where you could have one of our performance engineers at the track with you. Vehicle dynamics consulting, where we'll help you with vehicle dynamics and tire development. And also simulation software in the areas of kinematics, dynamics and tires. Thank you for watching the video and I'll be waiting for your next questions. <laughs>